So Ruth, as I told you before we started recording, I finished the book of form and emptiness this morning and I'm, I'm a wreck. <laughs> Oh, I'm really, no. <laughs> I'm, but in the best sense of the word, because I think what your body of work has done for me, the four novels that I have read, I have not read the memoir, is ex it, it expands my sense of what's possible. I don't even have words for it, but there's a transmission in this book that I am stunned by and I'm so grateful for. So thank you. Well, thank <laughs> I don't you know so what much. else to say. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, again, as I said before, I don't know whether to say to apologize or to say thank you. No, <laughs> but you I'm can't apologize that, because this is, it's part of what the book is about is what books do yeah. to us. And you did it. Yes, that's right. No, I think that's right. Books are supposed to move us and not that they're supposed to. A book would say, we're not supposed to do anything. <laughs> don't lay your expectations on us. But, <laughs> but I think that the books that we love are the books that move us. And uh, so that's always my, I think, as I'm writing, I'm writing in order to investigate some questions that I have about the world, about this crazy time that we live in. It's a very confusing time, I think, that we live in now. And when I set out to write, I'm looking for answers and I'm looking for ways of thinking about and also being with some of the questions that I have. And often these are very emotional. They're things that I feel very strongly about. They're um, the biggest you know. questions. You take on the big questions, but you let the paradox of them yeah. live. Yeah. It's all four of your books have a strong environmental yes. and activism and message which is very important to me. I also live with, you live with an environmental scientist. Yeah, well, he's, he's an artist. Yeah. 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 My, my husband has worked in conservation his whole career, but you never hit us over the head with it. You allow us to engage in the question with you, which I think is one of also what makes it so powerful and makes it so moving and makes you think. Yeah. I think it's, it, it, I don't really, I don't write things because I have answers. I write things because I have questions. <laughs> if, if I'm writing, it's usually because I have a question that I want to investigate. And so often there's never one answer to anything, right? There, there's always multiple answers and multiple ways of thinking about things. And so I guess what I'm, what I hope ends up happening is that readers will, will read my books and be moved by them to ask these questions to join in that inquiry. So I certainly don't want to ham, I don't have answers. So I, it's not like I want to hammer people over the head with, with my, whatever, my beliefs or my thoughts or anything like that. No, that's not what it's. Like. That's very brave. I think a lot of people, when they set out to make their creative work, do think they need answers or they need to provide yes. or find answers. I have struggled with that. So yeah. Hearing you say that just makes my whole kind of heart just opens up in my mind of, oh, what questions do I have instead yes. of what answers? Yes, yes, absolutely. I always think you're an interviewer, so you know this, right? That the inviting way to enter a dialogue is with questions. And that what's what shuts <laughs> down a conversation is when one person starts providing all the answers. <laughs> and we all I know was, people like that, don't we? <laughs> I was just thinking, I was in Seattle recently to see my daughter and the, uh, the salmon were spawning. And we were by a volunteer who was trying to explain to a man about the salmon, but the man was much more interested in mansplaining to the volunteer <laughs> about what he knew. And we walked off just laughing so hard. I know, I know, I know. Nothing shuts down a conversation more quickly than somebody explaining things to us. And so I think that's that's one facet of this. But another facet of it, I think in, in Buddhism, we talk about, in Zen, we talk about Suzuki Roshi, who's the, the, the teacher, the kind of founding teacher of the branch of, of Zen that I practice. He had this, this phrase or this teaching, which was in the, in the expert's mind, possibilities, mm -hmm. sorry, in the beginner's mind, possibilities are endless, right? In the expert's mind, they are few, right? And I think that, so the way to 
the way that I like to approach any writing project is with this attitude of not knowing. And hopefully by the, by the time I finish the project, I'll know a little bit more. But another thing that we often say is not knowing is most intimate. Mm. And there's a real intimacy to not knowing. There's a vulnerability involved in not knowing that makes you very open and receptive to things if you can be, right? If you can allow that and not get hung up on, oh, I should know, but I don't feel like I should know anything. It's really confusing. <laughs> it is part of good. It is part of the gift of getting older. Yeah. Is going, I, know, right? I really yeah. know nothing. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I know nothing. I used to think I knew things. And then I thought I needed to know things, especially parenting. <laughs> and now it's, yeah, I don't know anything. That's hilarious. And, yes, absolutely. I think so much of this is just about getting older and accepting the fact that, that we don't maybe know quite as much as we think we, as we think we do. But to go to that not knowing and vulnerability and thinking about this form of art called interviewing and you're also a professor so there's a form of art and encounter where we do feel like we need to know so how do you negotiate that I would be terrified if I was coming in here not knowing your body of work not having spent time reading your other articles and interviews listening to other podcasts and I'm sure you would feel terrified going into the classroom mm -hmm. or maybe not I just i yeah, no, of course. And, and I do prepare and I prepare a lot. So I think preparation though, certainly when I go into a classroom and, and it's because I'm teaching creative writings, I'm teaching something that is creative. And this is, I think what you do as well. And so there's no knowing that that really does depend on every person finding their own way of being creative. There's no one answer. And I, so this is something that I'm constantly hearing myself. I preface every remark with, this is how I do it, but everyone is different. Every writer is different. And so what I'm trying to do is encourage my students anyway, to expect and to realize that no, there's no right way to do it and try a whole bunch of different things. Keep trying something different until you find something that works. And then again, in my experience, I find something that works right and then and it's working for one book and then as and then soon it as I try to work. apply it for the next book it's it already doesn't work right? so then you start the process all over again it's okay what's going to work for this book so it's always a kind of an, an open inquiry and I think that's that's really what I'd like my students to come away with is the sense of approach the practice with some kind with openness with curiosity and so I think it goes back to this idea of questions again there's nothing like curiosity to make any situation work as soon as you as soon as you stop being curious about something then it's over um so certainly in writing but curiosity requires self-trust. Like one of the things I'm just getting from you being in this moment with you is how it, it, there's a deep sense of trusting yourself, of knowing yourself as much as we can know ourselves because we're mysteries as, much as, as we humans. Can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And building that self-trust, especially in the women creatives I work with, it seems sometimes very difficult. It is. I think it is really difficult. Yeah, I think it really is. That it's um, been beaten out of us by the culture yeah. or by yeah. teachers or by our own fantasies of what we're supposed to be. I think the fantasies about what we're supposed to be, I think that that projection of some kind of ideal of some kind of, oh, this is the way, this is the way people should, this is the way I should do it because this is the way it's done. And mm -hmm. since I don't, since I really don't believe that. And, and at the beginning, of course, I also believed that I bought into that. And so this is one of the wonderful things about getting old too. <laughs> little by little, you realize no, there's no way this needs, that this should be done. It's up to me. I get to choose. I get to mm. choose. And I have to keep experimenting. And if it works for me, then that's the way, that's the way it should be. But that is, you're right. It, it's something that I think you have to grow into. And, and I think the way, the way that we grow into it is by practice. And for me, it's a writing practice and it's a meditation practice. It's a Zen practice. It's doing something over and over and over again. And, and I think through that process of repetition, of practice, that's where the trust comes from. You realize it's like any muscle. The muscle gets stronger. And again, this is something that I try to impart to my students, encourage them to just, to just keep at it and just keep doing it again and again, even when all of the demons 
come up and start telling you that, no, you're not doing it right, or you should be doing it this way, or all of those negative voices that we've really internalized, I think, especially as women, because it's a survival issue for women. Mm -hmm. We internalize, I think, these voices because we're, we're... We learn to do that early in order to survive. We have to be very patient with ourselves and also very patient with those negative, those negative voices too, because really they're just trying to help. They're trying to help us survive. Sometimes they can be allies and become good, good partners. They've helped me definitely build the business part of my writing and uh, teaching life. Did you have a Zen practice when you wrote your first novel? That was, let's see now, that was 1997, 98. Yes, I was, I was practicing, uh, not Zen at that time. I was practicing in a Tibetan, with a Tibetan teacher. And I had been practicing and meditating regularly since, uh, I'm going to say 1995. That's when I started Mm -hmm. taking it seriously. I'd, I'd meditated a lot before that as well, but it was really only in 1995 that I got a hit of what was to come. My my parents were getting old. My mom was showing signs of dementia. My dad, his heart was failing. It was very clear to me that he was um, not going to be living much longer. And I suddenly, I realized like, whoa, this is really serious. All of this sickness, old age and death stuff, like it's real. <laughs> you know? It's actually coming it's for real. you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, act- it's not- real. <laughs> that's right. I'm not getting out of this. Like I thought I was special (laughs) and somehow I wasn't going to go through that. I remember that moment. My mom had as well. So it's like when it hits you, you're just like, whoa, this is serious. And then I'm an only child. So I realized like this whole thing is going to fall on me and I need strength. I need to figure out a way of getting stronger so I can, I can bear this burden. I can sit through what and get through what I need to get through. And so that's, I I just had a, a kind of an instinct that Buddhism was going to help and would provide that. And certainly the meditation practice would provide, would help me strengthen my backbone. And it, it's why I, I started meditating regularly and practiced in the Tibetan tradition for a while, and then ended up moving to the West Coast and uh, meeting Norman Fisher, who's mm-hmm. my teacher now. And he has an organization called Everyday Zen. And I started practicing with him. And it was great because Norman's a writer. I felt very, I felt like he really got it. He knew <laughs> what it was to be a creative person and to be somebody who's practicing formally in a spiritual tradition. And so that was a wonderful sort of turning point for me. And yeah, so I guess to answer your question, I had been practicing, I I think My Year of Meats was published in 1998. So I I had just started practicing seriously then and then just continued. I really see your practice impacting the novels. They've, they, I love them all. Yeah. but they've changed, especially this last book. It feels like it's holding formlessness in a form. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. Cause it's, it, it's so hard to describe in words, isn't it? But the sadly, yeah, cause we're writers, <laughs> cause we're writers, exactly. <laughs> But it's exactly that, you know, what I was, what I was trying to suggest was really the way that, you know, that books in this case, but the way that any, you know, that anything, right, work of art, any relationship, the way it comes into being. In other words, it finds form. And so it was exactly that, that process of emergence that I was trying to um, evoke somehow in the book. And I think one of the things about the the book that was was fun for me was that the book is actually the narrator of the book. Right? I know that was yeah. sometimes when I'm reading, and I have to say, it's because near the end of the book, you write about how the reader changes each book or each thing that yes. they write. And okay. I thought, oh God, sometimes I feel like I fail the books. Sometimes oh. I feel like I'm not getting it. And and when the book yeah. was talking to me, and I don't mean to give too much away, y'all, so we'll be really yeah. careful. So you can read yeah. the amazing book and have the experience that I had that I was like, am I, what is she doing here? Am I getting it? Am I understanding yeah. it? And I, I think yeah. I got glimpses of it, but it, it, I, I digress. think you did understand. Well, I think you certainly did understand it. No, my idea about reading and writing is that it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. It's a, co- it's actually more than that. It's a collaboration. And I, I write 
this book. It takes me eight years to do it, but I eventually finish it. <laughs> and, and we think of it, we talk about a book as if it's singular, as if it's a thing. But I don't think it is a thing. I don't think it exists as a single entity. I like to think of it more that the book goes out into the world and it starts to interact with others. And so it interacts with you, it interacts with other readers, and that's where the collaborative process begins. Mm -hmm. And so whatever book that you and I, you know, that you and I then over time, because this is, I'm not actually actively participating in it anymore, <laughs> but over this kind of long stretched out time, which could be hundreds of years mm -hmm. in the case of a long dead author, that we co-create a book that is unique. And so whatever book you and I have co-created, I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And that is our book. And that, and so then that's the case. The same thing holds with hopefully thousands of other readers, that there are thousands of versions of the book out there and they're all equally valid and they're all equal. And they're, so they're, they're relationships at that point. Right. And do you ever, do you ever want to know, do you ever wish you could go into that collaboration right. wherever it exists as the writer and go, oh my God, what did Jen actually experience actually, I know, in right? her brain yeah. <laughs> well, you see, and this, is, this morning finishing yeah. it? And this is why when I, I do a lot of interviews, right? Mm -hmm. Every interview is different because mm -hmm. every reader has read a different book. And so it's always interesting to me, even when the question is the same, even when the question is the same, the reader is different. And so then answering the question and the kind of dialogue that ensues it is always interesting to me because it's like, ah, oh, yes, exactly. Like it's a way that you get to venture in. Yeah, yeah, you get exactly. to venture in exactly. a little bit to my experience. Yeah. That's right. Towards the end of the book, you also wrote one of the characters, the bee man says, stories are real, my boy, they matter. If you lose your belief in your story, you lose yourself. Mm -hmm. And like my, my whole body just stopped. I'm like, I believe this to be so true. And I believe we're living in a time where the stories that we collectively agree on are, are falling apart, they're fraying. And that needs to happen. And a lot of the stories are bad stories. They're wrong yeah. stories. Yeah. But it also feels really scary because it feels like some of the stories are what's kept us able to communicate with each other, to mm -hmm. coordinate action, to have mm -hmm. functioning governments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. It just you feels know, like I, an odd, it feels like my belief in stories has gotten even stronger, but at the same time, it feels more almost more uh, misty. I think that's true. And I think that has a lot to do with media as we know it now. It has a lot to do with the internet. It has a lot to do with social media. It has to do with the way that media platforms are changing. Back in the day when there were three major broadcasters and they all broadcast CBS, NBC, ABC, they all broadcast the same news stories. It, there was a very clear sense of what the nation's story was. And now that's not, and that was the official story, right? That's there right. Were that all was the sanctions of story. stories. That's right. right. There were all sorts of stories being told that just weren't being recognized. But but in any case, now it has fractured the the sense of with, with the internet and social media there, there. I think it has gotten very fragmented and very hazy, very, there's lots and lots of particulate matter that are stories mm -hmm. floating around in the world. And so then it becomes, it does become, I think, hard to find some kind of coherence in, in the narrative that we attached to. But I also feel like that the thing about stories is that they they change all the time. They're constantly changing. They're constantly evolving. And so even when we think we have a story and we think that's the right story, time passes and then you suddenly realize, oh, that's not actually the right story at all. This is the right story. And you believe in that one for a little while and then time passes and you realize, oh, that wasn't the right story either. And, and I think that's what Right. Growing up is certainly about that. A number yeah. of times I you know, smack myself on the head <laughs> thinking like, what was I thinking? <laughs> true. Very true. It brings us back to that curiosity too. And that not knowing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and I'm just realizing that, the, the, that there's almost a younger part of me that wants those stories to stay the same. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We, we grab on to stories because they tell us who we think we are, but that isn't who we are. It's who we think we are. And, and so that we find some comfort, I think, in having these, these kinds of, these firm, these firm identities. They're evolving, they're changing, but they're not, they're not rigid. And if they were not changing, we'd be dead. When, when we die, that's when the story stops. That's when we can no longer create new ones.
But I just want to ask one more thing about this. If you lose your belief in your story, you will lose yourself. But mm-hmm. doesn't meditation help us lose our belief in the well, story about ourselves? I think that, I, I think it's more that story, it was that Thomas, I think you're referring to that Thomas King quote, right? He's an Aboriginal, he's a- Yes, indigenous. it was, It was. this was right before that, yeah. and then he talks about that. That's right, that's yeah. right. And I think the quote goes something like, the, the thing about stories is that, how does it go now? The thing about stories- I'll get it, is, I'll get yeah, it for you. Yeah, I got it. is that that's all we are. That In other words, we are the stories that we tell ourselves. The that's truth right. about stories is that is all we are. That's right. The truth we are about the stories, stories we tell ourselves. We make our right. make ourselves. We make ourselves up. <laughs> that's right. We make ourselves up. Yeah, that's right. The bottleman has a weird uh-huh. Slovenian kind of accent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I think that's the key is that that we are constantly making ourselves up and, and to and, see that and to yeah. hold it lightly and with curiosity. Exactly. Exactly. And to see that it's not. It, it's just a story. In other words, it's not an unchanging, rigid I- identity. No, Truth. it's a story. It's a story mm-hmm. and it can change. And we're, and we, we know this because of, for example, neuroplasticity. Brains are always changing. Our stories are always changing. And thank goodness, because otherwise we would never learn. Yeah. So well, the, the option, the, the alternative does feel very dead. Yeah. So I think that the idea is just holding that story lightly, lightly, exactly as you just said. Yeah. Just holding that story lightly. I yeah. love that. Yeah. So you've done a lot of different creative mediums. <laughs> <laughs> and oh my God. I, wa- <laughs> I wonder if you've noticed anything in common about how you work across these different uh, mediums. I think my, my method of working has changed over the years and I've become a lot looser. And I think this has to do with meditation and it also has to do with what you talked about it earlier, trust or, or faith that, that I, that these days, I think I welcome that not knowing into the process. I'm much less controlling about the way that I work. And I also invite a kind of a little bit of randomness and chaos into the process because I think that's interesting. And also because I know my brain and I know its limitations really well. We all get into kind of ruts of thinking Mm -hmm. and I know what my thinking ruts are. And so when I'm working on a new book, I'm always looking for ways of, of knocking myself, knocking myself out of my rut. And I don't think I used to do that as much. I think I was more of a kind of control freak planner. But these days I really am more of a, more of a fly by the seat of your pants. And also just inviting that in, right. Trying to make, trying to bring in unexpected elements as much as possible. I I have to say as someone who helps writers write, when I read about the random elements coming into the book and you would be like some, and I'm just going to include in the book, I'm like, Oh no, Oh my God, this is going to be a disaster. Don't tell other writers to do that. Because, but it's fantastic. You can feel it. You can feel it. When I read an interview about your mom having a box that was labeled empty box, (laughs) and then it ends up in the book. And I'm like, oh my God, I, you can feel the liveliness of that randomness. It totally works, but I, I would never tell a writer to do it. <laughs> it's, I think it also really has to do with the kind of thing that I'm trying to write. Yeah, and Absolutely. Yeah. And in this case, what I was really trying to, what I was experimenting with was this idea of objects. I was, I was experimenting with the idea of objects um, in this case, objects speaking. The objects speak to the protagonist, to, to the little boy. He hears them speaking. And so I knew that there were going to have to be lots of objects in the in the book. And so then it was a question of how do I, what objects do I invite into the book? And I looked around the room and immediately felt bored. And so <laughs> then I thought, you know, and so then I thought I'll make a rule for myself. I'll make it into a game. I'll make a rule for myself. And when something enters my life, an object or an idea, or even a, a piece of dialogue that's overheard, and it makes me sit up and pay attention, or another way of putting it, it is it sparks joy, then, you know, then I will 
put it in the book and see what happens. And I'll do a little show and tell here. Okay. My, my editor went to the Bahamas. She's writing a book about pirates. And so she went to the Bahamas on vacation and she came back and she brought me this. Oh, it's the snow globe, everybody. The you snow can globe. see it on the YouTube channel. That's right. It's the snow globe, right? It's the that snow you will... globe in the book. Yeah, in the book. And <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is fantastic because in the book, the, the mother, Benny's the little boy who's hearing the object speak, and his mother, Annabelle, has developed a bit of a hoarding problem. She's a collector. And so I just, I, when I saw the snow globe, I thought, this is fantastic. I will give this to Annabelle, the mother. And so I did, I gave it to Annabelle. And the next thing I knew she was on eBay, of course, <laughs> collecting snow globes. So that was really cool. That was really great. Another thing was I was out at a Chinese restaurant and I got this fortune, uh. which says the world is a beautiful book for those who read it. And that's also, and I thought, this is fabulous. I can't believe it. I'm going to put that in the book. So I did. And it generated a kind of vocabulary of images of little slips of paper with pertinent messages on them. So mm -hmm. that's where that idea came from. Another, I'll just tell you one more. I love was, these. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on an airplane. This was pre-pandemic and I was on an airplane and I was reading, I can't remember where I was coming back from, but I was reading, I think, an in-flight magazine and there was an interview with David Mitchell, the writer David mm -hmm. Mitchell, um, who I love. And, and I think the interviewer had asked something like, I can't remember, but it was something like, what would you never put into a novel because it was just so stupid? And, and David Mitchell's answer was, <laughs> David Mitchell, <laughs> David Mitchell's answer was fridge magnets. Fridge magnets that that dead people use to talk to the living. And I was like, oh man, I am totally putting fridge magnets into this book. Oh <laughs> it was like I love it. I, I was like, he threw down the gauntlet. Yeah, it was like he threw down the gauntlet. I was like, yeah, let me add it. So I did a conversation. I did a conversation with him recently, and I was like, those fridge magnets. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, recounted the story to him and he said he had no memory of that, but anyway, <laughs> I know he did. <laughs> I love it. I love the freshness that that brings. Yes. I can just feel it in my whole body. Yeah. It reminds me of an interview we did with a conceptual artist, Carrie Smith, and her whole creative process is random, is randomness. Yeah. Now she's yeah. not trying to construct narrative. She's making conceptual art, yeah. which is yeah. different. Different, so I, Yeah. Yeah. So I want to go back to, I want you to tell me about when you decided to write My Year of Meets, your first novel, oh, because the way that I read some of the interviews, it sounded like one day you just started writing and you kind of wrote furiously and you ended up with this fantastic book. Yeah. And somewhere else I read that you said, I always wanted to write novels, but of course, at that point you were um, a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how could you write something so great? right off the, like never having studied or, or thought about it or tried before. And I was a little jealous. <laughs> well, it's never that simple, right? I, I had, I'd wanted to write novels ever since I first read one, probably when I was about, I don't know, six, seven years old. When do you start reading your first On your you own, know, yeah. books? And, and uh, so I always wanted to, to do that. And this was, I was born in 1956. So it was probably like 1961, 62, somewhere around there that I first started reading like whole books fictional books, novels. And, and I wanted to write them. And I remember trying to write stories back then. And, but I also remember that as I was going through elementary school and also high school, junior high school, wanting to write stories, but not feeling entitled to the genre somehow. I'm mixed race. I'm a half, mm -hmm. I'm half Japanese, half Caucasian American. And, and back then there weren't any well-known Asian writers oh, of most of the writers were most of them were white many of them were male and a lot of them were dead and so <laughs> none of these things applied to me and so i remembered thinking early on that i, I uh, there aren't any writers like you know novelists like me but i, I could write poetry maybe i could write haiku that was like culturally appropriate. The problem is that I'm very verbose and, and I'm not a particularly good poet. And so that was, that was a kind of short lived um, you know, Experiment. Sort of period, but I did write poetry for a long time because I, I didn't know how I just, I, I didn't feel entitled to the genre. And this was Maxine Hong Kingston didn't mm. publish Warrior Woman until uh, the 19, I think 1970s and Joy Luck Club wasn't published until the 1980s. Until the 80s, and I was already right? in, yeah, I think I was 30 or something by mm -hmm. then. It was late for me to 
understand and to really think, well, I, could, I can do this too. I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important. Diversity in publishing is such an important thing. Representation. Um, representation is hugely important, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it gives us a sense of what our story might be. So in any case, um, secretly, I, I was writing stories the whole time. I was in, in college. I, I remember I took the one creative writing class that was offered and I loved it. After I graduated from college, I was pursuing an academic career at that point, but I was always writing fiction. I thought I would, I thought I would go into comp lit. I thought I would, I thought I would get a PhD and teach comp lit, comparative literature. And then sort of one thing led to another. I, I was in Japan. I, you know, met a guy, fell in love, came back to the, to the States and I had to get a job. I was living in New York and I had been studying classical Japanese literature. And it was not like, there were not a lot of jobs in New York City at the time for somebody with my skill set. And so my, my fiance at the time was working in the film business and he had been working in the art department and was making the switch over to the camera department. And so he suggested, because I had some, you know, art skills. He suggested that I start taking his art jobs. And so the first job I took was as a storyboard artist for a film called Matt Kerr Mutant Hunt. <laughs> 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 so I'm showing now the DVD uh, cover of the uh, the film. Okay, so I got a job as a storyboard artist for, for Mutant Hunt, and it turns out that they didn't. They ran out of time, and they looked around the table, and they were like, "Oh, we forgot to hire an art director," and I was the only one who wasn't doing anything. And they pointed at me, and they said, "You be the art director." I'd never set foot on a film set before, and I pointed this out to them, and they were like, "No problem." It was so low budget; it was painfully low budget. I think I was paid something like $200 a week or something like that to do this. And so I, I started working in the film business and I made a whole series, I helped make a whole series of movies. That one is Bre called Bre Breeders. Breeders. Yeah. And this <laughs> one, one of my favorites. Called, yeah, right. This one is called Necropolis. There were others too. Robot Holocaust was another one. Anyway, I made a whole series of these. I, I didn't make them. I, I worked, worked on, on a them. series of films like this. And then I moved into television. I moved into Japanese television because I spoke Japanese. And, and then once I was in television, little by little, I started, I started out producing, but then I started uh, directing and and eventually they let me start editing. And that's where I had a sense from the beginning that the editing room was where I needed to be in order to learn how to tell stories. And so, so I set my, yeah, I just set my sights on learning to edit and eventually they let me. And so they would, they would, I'd go out with my crew and film these crazy documentary shows, various kinds. And then I'd bring the hundreds of hours of tape back to Tokyo and sit in a disgusting little editing room that was filled with cigarette smoke for hundreds and hundreds of hours, painfully learning how to edit. And it was rough. These guys were like not nice. And so I'd spend hours and hours putting together a sequence. They'd come in, they'd look at it and they'd say no. And then I'd have to do it again and again. And at the end of that, so that was my, that was my training in storytelling. I made a couple of independent films of my own, including Having the Bones, which is, mm -hmm. that's my mom. There's a picture of my Aww. mom here. Yeah. Isn't she cute? She's beautiful. She's, sit, she's sitting on a crescent moon. And, and then I wanted to make an, I wanted to make more films, but I had maxed out my credit cards making these films, making having the bones, making these independent films. And so I ended up getting a, a grant for, I remember it was $20,000 to write another screenplay. And I knew that I would never be able to make the film with $20,000. I was mm -hmm. in tremendous, I was in, I think I had $30,000 worth of credit card debt at the time. So, you know. That was a problem. And so basically I just misappropriated the, the funds, the grant money, and decided that I would write a novel instead. And when I sat down, and, and this was my year of meets, and it was based on the experiences that I'd had as a documentary film director for Japanese television. And um, I remember when I sat down to write that film, I had, I had always struggled with 
chronology. How do you move a story through time? Mm -hmm. If you have a character walking into a room on the far end and has to move across the room to all the way to the other side of the room where the action's happening. Back when I was first starting, I felt like I needed to yes. watch the character <laughs> yes, across yes. the room, which is really boring. Okay. I didn't understand that you could cut. I didn't understand about editing. And all those hundreds and hundreds of hours I spent suffering in editing rooms in Tokyo taught me how to do it. So when I sat down to write My Year of Meats, I suddenly knew how to do it. I had techniques that I'd never actually identified. <laughs> But I knew how to do it. I knew how to cut a story together quickly and make it suspenseful and make it make it a kind of uh, page turning driving story that that people would want to read because television is a very demanding medium. Mm -hmm. And if you don't if you don't grab a viewer right off the bat, you've lost them. So I learned how to do that. And so when I sat down to write my year of meets, I, I suddenly realized like, wow, compared to film, this is easy. This yeah. is like easy. You just write it and it happens. You don't have to film it. You, you don't, don't have, have to you film it. You don't have to coordinate with all these other people. And right. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. exactly true. You don't have to feed your crew. You don't, no, have to find, you, don't. you don't have to find bathrooms for them. It's like you just write it and it happens. Right? You can go to the bathroom in your own house. You don't even have to leave your house. No, it was fantastic. So it was a hugely liberating for me. I love that. Because one of the things I really do believe is that everything we've learned as people and as creative people, yeah. we can use. Yes, 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 yes. But it's that moment of recognizing yeah. that yeah. is so precious and important, yeah. putting those things together. Yeah. I think the other thing that I really understood then is that if you're a creative person, if you're a writer or filmmaker or anything else, that... Yeah, as you say, nothing is wasted, including all of the pain you know, <laughs> and suffering in your yes. life it yes. is you make it into something. And so it's a, it ends up being, it might be painful and it might be horrible at the time when you're trying to survive it, but it's a gift. Eventually, if you make something from it, it's- It becomes material. And I think so much of my own healing has happened when yes. I made it into something for someone else, very different than when I'm maybe journaling about it or just processing. And, yeah. and, and that actually brings me to a question. You've said you keep a process journal for each novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would love you to tell us a little bit about that and how also you don't get sucked into only processing and not actually writing the book. I have a kind of, I have a kind of way of using the process journal. I've kept one ever since I think 1996 or wow. so. And it's the same one, although I do break it into separate documents from time to time. And it's, yeah, so I was using it when I was writing My Year of Meets. I was using it when I was writing All Over Creation, A Tale for the Time Being, this, the, all of the, the process of every single novel has been worked through in the process journal. And I think of the process journal more as, it's almost like a physical space. Or another way I sometimes think of it is that it's like a friend. And it's a friend who, you know, who like never gets tired of, of your obsessions. And you can always talk to your process journal about any aspect of your writing. The process journal shares your interests and your passion. And the thing that's interesting about the process journal is that it's always a little bit wiser than it's always just a little bit wiser and it's unfailingly supportive never gets bored with with all of your your mishigas and it it's committed to standing by you through through thick and thin through through everything that you do and so the way i use it is i i do use it to to whine and complain okay mm -hmm. so that that's it it listens to me when i whine and complain about being stuck or whatever but i also i, I use it i ask questions it's a place where i record my questions and it goes mm -hmm. back to what we were talking about mm -hmm. at the very beginning it's one thing to have a question it's another thing to write it down and to formalize it and so by writing it down by writing down my questions in my process journey, Journal, right. It, it makes them real. It makes them concrete. I, I won't forget them. And then very often I'll use the process journal as a place to brainstorm answers. 
okay, I'll have a question and, and then I'll just almost close my eyes and start brainstorming answers, a list of answers, a list of possibilities. They're not even answers. Let's call them possibilities. So I brainstorm these lists of possibilities. Sometimes I do it. Most of the time I do this on the computer. You don't handwrite it. Huh? I, and the reason is because I want to keep it with me all the time and you mm. run out, it, I'll never run out of pages if it's on the computer. And, but sometimes I do move on to the page when I want to do idea clouds or just <laughs> play in a more nonlinear way. And so that's fun too. So I, I use it as a place to ask questions, to copy, to write down ideas. Very often what I try to do is at the end of every writing session, I check in with my process journal and, and I'll ask some questions or give myself an assignment for the next day. So it's a place where I also hold myself accountable. And very often, if it's a question that I've asked, the unconscious is a wonderful thing. And it does a lot of work. <laughs> We're not conscious. <laughs> and, and so certainly at night in a dream state, it, it's working, right? And so if you've articulated the, the question and made it concrete, very often I'll find that I'll wake up the next morning with, with ideas about the direction to take something, to ideas for the scene or whatever. So that's that's really helpful. If I've given myself an assignment, so the first thing I do the next morning before I start a writing session is I check in with my process journal and I look and and it, it that way you're never confronting the blank page. You, right. you always know, oh, there that's what I'm supposed to do. And so you jump in and, and immediately what it is that you need to do. So that's very helpful. I make to-do lists of things that I need to research. I give myself deadlines. I will, at the end of a writing session, sometimes if I'm trying to put the pressure on a little bit. I'll note down word count, like how many words I wrote that day or how many pages I wrote that day or how many pages I edited or whatever it is. And that's just to put a little pressure on. Sometimes it's about, sometimes I find that counting pages and counting words is not motivating. And so in that case, I'll, I'll make, I'll note down the number of hours that I work. Yeah. So I am very flexible about what because the, your needs change all the time. They do. I, and yeah. what works for your brain to motivate you changes. It Something changes. Can seem like, oh, I did 400 words today. I suck. Yeah, exactly. And especially <laughs> it if took you're, two hours. <laughs> right. And especially if you're trying to do it, I very often, I'm trying to take words out. That's so then right. it's, yay, I took out 400 words today. Fantastic. <laughs> Could you give us an example of some of the questions that you might put in the process oh, journal that come to mind? Very simply, like what happens next? <laughs> That's overly simplistic, but it might be a question. I'll, very often it'll be a motivation question. I think, I think Annabelle, I think Annabelle should go to the library, but I don't know why, why she is going or, or what she wants to, what she wants to do there. And so that, that's the problem. I think I know that, I know that Benny and his, his friends need to, to get out of the city but so where do they go and how do they get there? Benny, I have this sense that there, one of Benny's friends is a, is a conceptual artist named the Aleph and she's semi-homeless and she hangs out at the library. She lives in the library. And, and, and another character is the, the bee man who you mm -hmm. mentioned before, the bottle man, who's a kind of Slovenian poet philosopher who, who's missing a leg and gets around in a wheelchair. And he also hangs out at the library. And so a lot of the scenes are in the library. And I just felt they really need to get out of the library. We need a change of scene here. So where can they go? And then it occurred to me, oh, okay, they are squatting in an abandoned factory building. And so then, okay, is the Aleph making work there? Is she making art there? And what kind of art does she make? Mm -hmm. And so I'll ask that question. And then, then I sit down to write the scene and I know that it's an abandoned factory building. So I get Benny there and we go up into the room and they have some soup and we move over to, and I'm like a camera at this point, we move over, the camera tracks over to the corner of the room where the Aleph is working. And I look around and lo and behold, she's making catastrophic snow globes. <laughs> she's making snow globes, but they're weird because she's weird, right? She's making snow globes <laughs> of natural disasters of like the earthquake and tsunami and meltdown at, at Fukushima, 9-11. She's making these weird dark snow globes. And so and those are the kinds of questions that I might ask. And I, and then when I sit down to write, the questions have been percolating in my mind overnight or however long. Mm -hmm. And so when I actually go there, I can just 
rather than planning it all out, I just follow the action, follow the characters. And my unconscious, I think, this is how it works. I don't know because I'm not conscious of my unconscious, but it generates the material somehow. And so I'm, as I'm following the characters, suddenly it becomes clear to me, oh, I can see the sketches for the snow globe on the wall. And so then I write it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank yeah. you for that. That yeah. was yeah. that was yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So that's the process journal. And I, again, I, I also um, write about books that I'm reading, if, if, especially if there's stuff that I you know, would like to steal, techniques I want to try, that goes into the process journal. It's pretty open-ended, but it's, I found it just tremendously helpful. And again, I encourage my students to, to experiment with that and find a way of doing this that works for them. Ruth, there's a question I like to ask every guest at the end, yeah. and it is, what do you want to learn next? Mm. <laughs> seriously seriously <laughs> yeah, okay um I okay so right before I right before the pandemic I just started getting into indoor rock climbing I f- I just fell in love with it it was just like oh my god this is this is something that I can do and then the pandemic hit and the gyms closed mm-hmm. and I had to stop So what I really want to do is get back on the wall. I I want to climb the wall. (laughs) That's fantastic. That was completely unexpected. I love it. That's what I would like to do. And I would like to get, I would, okay, seriously, I would like to get really good at it, but it's, I'm 65. It's probably not going to happen. So I'd like to get good enough so that it's, it's, it's fun and I can engaged and proud of myself. Oh, that's fantastic. (laughs) If you ever come out here to climb in Colorado, I'd love to make you dinner. (laughs) Okay. I'll take you up on that. I hope I'll take you up on that. My husband will make dinner because I don't actually cook. (laughs) Even Ruth, better. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for enriching my life so much oh. with the, the books you've written and this conversation has filled me to the brim. Thank you oh. so much. Well, thank you so much for 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 the conversation, for for being my collaborator and <laughs> making a wonderful book. So thank you. <laughs>